Hi, my name is Eric Van Dusen, and I uh, want to take you through teaching with Jupyter Notebooks uh, using the data science approach uh, that we think can be used in any class. Uh, first of all, I want to point out uh, the Academic Resources Kit, a one-pager of all these different open source resources that I put together for educators at other universities to sort of understand how they all come together. The part that I'm going to explain today is how we on-ramp uh, professors in other departments to teaching with the data science approach. What I call this is the data science pedagogy platform. Our campus has an amazing resource, which is the Campus Jupiter Hub. It was built for the large Data 8 class with the vision of inclusion and accessibility. Any machine can run it in a browser window, an iPad or a Chromebook will work. It was developed for this large student class, 1,200 students, but it comprises a set of tools for active learning. The program that I worked with uh, also puts uh, connectors and modules classes onto the same infrastructure. Uh, it's built to be scalable. It's built on a stack of an open textbook, open source software used to do the compute, and an open source approach to the curriculum. The curriculum is there to share with instructors at all universities. And our proposal is that these tools can be used for all types of classes. First element of the pedagogy platform is Python. Uh, this is a computer science language that is also a first-rate language for data science, uh, where people do data manipulation, data vi visualization, and statistics, and opens up a world of scientific computing. The second is the file type, or, uh, which is called Jupyter Notebooks. These are viewable in the browser. They're a place to manage the coding in Python, but they're also used for interactive computing in that you can work your code and see your outputs in the same place. And as an instructor, you can do a lot of formatting and explanation of the code as you go. The third element is a Jupyter Hub. This is a campus server. Uh, there are many different options, but today I'm going through the UC Berkeley implementation of a server for all of campus that supplies the notebooks to the user. Fourth is GitHub, uh, uh, which is a website where people uh, store and host open source software code. Fifth is what I call the special sauce. It's a simple thing called an interact link. It's a single link that allows you to distribute uh, assignments to your students and with a single link they pull a copy of the assignment from GitHub into their own instance on their own browser. The sixth is an element that I'm really proud of at UC Berkeley are the amazing students who help us build this curriculum. They've been through Data 8. Some of them are upper division students, and they help us build this awesome curriculum for all sorts of classes. First element is Python. We have lots of discussions whether to teach Python or R for data science. What we think is that Python is a great place to learn both computing and statistics at the same time computational and inferential thinking. It's a broad language. There are so many different tools available. It's relatively easy to teach and it's relatively easy to read. For teaching at UC Berkeley, the instructors of Data8 built a special package called the Data Science Python package that anybody can read in. And this is a smaller subset of commands that's easier for students to master instead of starting users out uh, with pandas on the first time. Once students are in the Jupyter Notebooks, however, they can use all of the possible packages in the scientific computing ecosystem, pandas, stats models, scikit-learn if they want to, an on-ramp to machine learning. Uh, there's open source mapping and Folium. Uh, there's all sorts of different graphical and visualization products as well. Jupyter Notebooks can be envisioned in multiple ways, one of which is they're a file type. They're a place where you could share a file between collaborators or between teacher and student that would have a mixture of code and explanatory formatted text. Uh, they, can be, they can actually work in Python, R, Julia, or dozens of other languages, but we mostly are working in Python here. They're made for reproducibility. They're made for working, having different researchers come to the same results. A lot of the advantages for reproducibility are really strong for teaching. The teacher knows that every student 
in the class should be able to come to the same results because we're using this robust file system. It's also very interactive. Students can change the code, tweak the code, add a variable, and see the results immediately. See the outputs in the same browser window where they're doing their coding. Here's a simple view of a Jupyter Notebook that I use to teach economics. Very simple economics. Some of the code the students don't need to know, and then we can, we can uh, start with the formatted text. It's all in one tab of the browser. Um, it's all in one single narrative uh, place. As an aside, there was an Atlantic article from a couple of summers, uh, a couple of years ago that I used to teach my mom what I do. Uh, this is a great article because it motivates how Jupyter Notebooks could be really revolutionary in the area of scientific publishing. Instead of sending your graphs and your data along with the journal submission, maybe in the future you'll send your code and the data and the reviewers will be able to reproduce what you did. Quick pitch aside for reproducible science, this is something that's upending and a revolutionary moment in a lot of different fields of science at the university. Uh, we should be doing our data science better. Uh, we should um, have ways that people reviewing and people, um, people at, at other labs should be able to reproduce what we've done. And there's a whole coding part of that that's like, uh, coding and documents that explain what you're doing, that's version control with timestamps, that's are automating all of the different steps, um, and a documentation of the data, and needing a computational environment that works across different researchers. So this wave of reproducibility is also moving through universities at the same time, and so teaching with Jupyter is also teaching these students these first class tools for reproducible science. So the campus has a Jupyter Hub. At UC Berkeley, it's called datahub.berkeley.edu. Anyone with a Berkeley login can log in. If you log in, you would see a screen like this with all of the different classes that you might have. A new user might not have any, but I visit a lot of classes. You could go into your classes, find your, find your work this way, and start computing. Here's a view, a day in the life of the Jupyter Hub. This is a little bit, uh, a little bit old, uh, you can see in this one at the peak, there's about 600 users. I think we're closer to 1,000 users at the peak right now. Uh, but you can just see a lot of people are logged on at any given time of day. Um, this is an incredibly powerful set of tools using Kubernetes to sort of spread the load across different cloud resources and be really efficient with its consumption of, of uh, cloud compute. Fourth element is GitHub. GitHub is an open source software development environment, a place where people share code and mark up their code. Um, people work on projects together. There's a lot of uh, uh, powerful tools for working on projects together. It's where we have a library of all the curriculum that we've built, and I encourage you to check out github.com slash dsmodules to see all the different classes we've worked on. A single class would have a single repo with all of the work from that class in it. GitHub can also host open source books. Uh, the Data8 textbook was built out of GitHub, um, and, and other books can be hosted there as well. The fifth is this element, which can take a public GitHub repository, a public GitHub folder of resources, and if you direct them to a Jupyter Hub, with a single link, you can send students all of the files they need to do the assignment. This is from a web page where you can make these links. And if there's one thing that I'd love to have you try in the lab part is try making an NB Git Puller link and see how easy it is to distribute materials to the students. Here's a workflow. Let's think about the top line. Where are the different learning management systems? Uh, an instructor would uh, put one of these interact links into the assignment one on the LMS. The students click the link, invisibly sort of, behind the scenes. Every user, uh, the link creates uh, through GitHub, every user gets a unique copy in their own directory of all of the files, the Jupyter Notebooks and the data files that they need to do the work. They work in Jupyter in a browser window. Uh, 
could be in class, could be a homework. At the end, they're going to save that as a PDF and upload it back to the learning management system. Let's think about how this would work as an instructor. First, make a new notebook, uh, work with the team if you're at UC Berkeley, or um, find a notebook of ours and uh, hack it for your class. You could do this on the Jupyter Hub server, or you could do it on your own local machine with a local install of Jupyter. Make a public repo on GitHub, upload the notebook and the data set that you want students to work on, then make an interact link using the address of the public GitHub repo that you just made. Then post that link to your class webpage, put it on the LMS, send it to the students with an email. We have all this and more described in an open source book that's for our faculty, uh, but has a whole bunch of useful resources for all sorts of instructors. Um, although this is mostly UC Berkeley facing, there's a lot of explanation of the different workflow and how to use the different tools to teach effectively. Now, as an instructor, there's a lot of choices that go in how to design a great Jupyter Notebook for teaching. On the one hand, uh, you could just give students mostly blank. Just read the data set in and get students to uh, you know, specify their own model, run a regression, apply machine learning. On the other hand, uh, you could have the notebooks completely filled out. All the code is done, and students just need to provide analysis. I do this in my economics introductory class where the coding is done uh, and students just need to write me uh, an explanation of what they see happening in the different graphs. The true art of making great notebooks is somewhere in the middle. How to give students the tools little by little and have them apply them in new contexts. If you look through the Data 8 curriculum, there's a great amount of thought in how notebooks are designed, to be narrative, explanatory, uh, and build on things that the students learn uh, ele element by element. Another thing that's great for instructors to think about is there are interactive widgets, you, what you call in called iPy widgets. Um, these make the notebooks interactive without changing the code. You can just slide a slider, click a button, do a drop down. And these allow students to interact with the data in perhaps simpler, more directed ways. In my basic economics class, I was having the students apply a tax by moving a slider and changing the equilibrium and changing the amount of welfare. In a sociology class that had students going out into neighborhoods and working in, in different neighborhoods, uh, students were able to use a drop down to uh, choose the census tract they wanted to look at. In the legal studies class, uh, widgets were used for more complicated models for students to select which features they wanted to look at or rotate um, a principal components model. So here's a simple application in my economics class, a supply and demand curve where the students can shift the two curves using a slider and the equilibrium point will be recalculated. This is a reinforcement of thing that students are learning with pencil and paper and how to solve in an elemental way. But by doing them uh, graphing on the computer, we can do, we can reinforce that learning. Thanks. Please be in touch. My email is ericvd at berkeley.edu. Our general email is dshelp at berkeley.edu. There's a whole set of open source resources for people looking to adopt this. data.berkeley.edu slash external portal. Thank you.